possible to not peek and see, but this time, let's build it from this point instead. So I think we are, we use this point as the kind of the starting reference point. So now we'll build it from this point and see if you can do it with the process that we talked about and uh, without peeking last time, that what we did last time, using this as the reference point. You can work together. Just just don't just copy down what you just don't copy your notes and change the numbers from last time. So we really want to think about it. Okay, where's Aaron? Aaron, talk to me about getting started here. How'd you get started? Okay. And what what is that? Ten point four four minus five point one six. What is that? No, not the answer. Sorry, not the answer. But what is it? What does it represent? What is it? Why did you do that? Uh, original minus the second. Okay, what are you trying to calculate here? What what is it you're trying to compute? A y value? Is it y? It's not y. It's a change in y, right? Change in y. Okay, what else? Change of x. And what was the change in x? It was the Okay. 2.2, good. And why did you get those two? What are you going to do with all that? That's k, right? It's the value of k. That is the constant rate of change. That's the constant rate of change. Change in y divided by change in x. And you got, Aaron? 2.4. Okay, so now we want to use the 5.1, 10.44 as our initial or reference point. Going from there, Nathan. Where's Nathan? Yeah. All right, talk to me. So, what'd you do? Uh, I'm asking you what you did after finding the constant rate of change. Um, I used the uh, y minus y y. Okay, so we did a little different form. So our form of that was kind of like y equals y1 plus, we kind of built this up. And we not just used it, but like came to understand what it all meant. So uh, do you remember what our first step was when we did that to build that up? Um, get the change in x. Change in x, okay. So did you make a reference point here somewhere? Like just a... a like some arbitrary point x y. No. All right, so that's kind of what we're we're doing. So this, we can just put it here. It doesn't matter. It could be anywhere. So we'll call it x y. And that that is any point on the line, right? So that's why I'm calling it x and y. Variables vary, right? Variables vary, and so that x could be any x, and then the y would be the corresponding y to that x. And you said you want to get the change in x. So what's the change in x starting at five point one? And ending at x. Um, x minus 5.1. Right. And that's this part right here of that that form that you quoted. Okay, that's that right there. That's the change in x. Okay, let's have someone else take over from here. Someone start like that? Someone start like that? Kind of? You should have. This is practicing the process we learned last time. Jake, did you start like that? Yeah. And then what'd you do next? Um, I found the change in y. Okay, how'd you do that? Um, I did the same thing for change of x and change of y. Okay, so 
That's valid. So you did what? Y minus 10.44? Okay, that's valid, but we let's use let's use our constant rate of change reasoning to do it. So if we if we have a change in x, how can we all always calculate a change in y using every one of our three um, perspectives on constant rate of change? Cameron, do you remember? Okay, how do I, what should I do? How do I use the k value? Five this times two point four? Uh, yeah. Not quite. So what what is the delta y is what? Equals what? Yeah. K delta x, right? K delta x. And what is K? We found it? And what was our delta x? It's Faisal, right? Keep going. What's delta x? Um, Not quite. So we found. So the whole point is we found it in step one, right? We found delta x in step one. So what is delta x? That's right. Change in x starting at starting at five point one, ending at x. So let's let's draw this. So if we're here, where should I? How do I represent a change in x from here? Up, down, left, or right? But here is my point now. So here is my final point. So I am going to go left, right? Correct. I'm going to go left. There we go. So that delta x is still final minus initial. X minus 5.1. And when X changed that much, wow, something's weird here. I don't know, it's like it's it's like not straight. Okay. Delta Y. We use constant multiple reasoning, right? Constant multiple reasoning that every delta y is just k times the corresponding delta x. So that's that 2.4 times x minus 5.1. Finally, so now we're ready for this. And what was the idea behind this right here rather than just, oh, it's just point slope form? What was the idea behind that equation? Do you remember? What did we say? How, where did we get that from? Yeah? It represents uh, every possible possible point on the line. Right, but okay, that's actually true. So that's it's every line point in the line, but the form of it, like building this, how did we build it? For by what idea did we build that thing? Slope. No. Remember what we said? Where does that come from? Uh, the constant multiple is just this part here, that's the k delta x. But so this whole form, something equals something plus something. That's what it says. What equals what plus what? Is it new y? New y. Plus y. Yeah, new y equals old y plus change in y. That's where that comes from, right? That's that's where that form comes from. That we're we're actually after. What does this equal right here? Here's the here's the key. What does that thing equal? That's our new value of y. Well, it equals the y that we, the old y that we started at. Plus, how much y changed? Okay, so what was the old y? 10.44. And how much did y change? 2.4 times. That's our change in y that we got from k delta x, which we did in the chicken example and the flag pole example, right? We did that. So then, like Allah said, this is now this represents every single point on the line. Given an x, it will crank out the corresponding y. So it will give you every single point on the line. So it represents the whole line. Let's see how I do here. Better than the last class. Right. So why do we sweep it with our? If it's just a bunch of points, why do we sweep it with our hand? Why? Because it takes like 
as a millionth of the time, right? So if we were to sit there and do every point, which, which is what it really is, it would take too long. So we just sweep it like that, and but we look at it and we know, what is it? It's an infinite number of points. Each point showing a particular coordinate coordination of an x and a y coordinate, right? Association of x and y, each one of those points. Okay, so that's kind of review. So if we take this, let's do some algebra on this and get a different form, okay? So do you see that we would, if we kind of multiplied this out and regrouped things, we'd have 2.4x would be one of our terms. Do you see that? And then what will we have? We'll have 10.44 and also negative 5.1 times 2.4. And if we do the math, we get 0.18. So someone, this whole thing is what? Negative 1.8. Is that what you got? We have confirmation. OK, what did I, so is this a new line? the same line. I just did a valid computation, right? Valid algebra and math and just change the form of this. It's the exact same set of points. But what does it look like now? What is you all recognize this? Mx plus b, right? So by multiplying out that that new y equals old y plus delta y form, rearranging things, we can get it to look like mx plus b. What's m? What's the slope of the line? The constant rate of change, right? So that slope of that line is showing us the constant rate of change. And then b stands for? Y intercept, in this case, negative 1.8, which is accurate with my sketch here. It's in the neg negative territory for y, right? Negative 1.8. So there's a dozen ways to approach lines, okay? And so you've probably learned something different in the past. If you want to learn a previous method that you learned to check this, I'm all for that. Use it to check. But this, this process, you're going to practice it again in the homework. You're responsible for knowing that process. Why? Because it's really forcing us to, to do this stuff in terms of what it means. Two quantities changing together at a constant rate of change. Instead of, here are the steps, and you get the answer, and I can, I can just go do my laundry, right? Or have a snack, right? So, no, so this has meaning, right? We look at this, and this has, this has tons of meaning, right? Start at some value of y, add the change in y, we get the new y. And where did that change in y come from? It came from the constant rate of change times the change in x, okay? So it's, it's modeling, we're, we're trying to do, a, we're, coming up with this equation as a model of how x and y are changing together. And this is a very, constant rate of change is a very, very specific way that the two quantities can change together. Okay, very specific, very special. Okay. All right, any questions on that? So in your homework, your written homework and online, you just you think, think about this process. Don't just, don't say, oh, I know how to do lines, I'll do it my way. No, you're responsible for this way. Okay, so learn it. You can use your way to check. Use your way to check. Okay, so let's build on this example here. So we said that y was, we ended up with 2.4x minus 1.8, right? All right, I want to put some quantities on this. Some actual real, real world situation. Here we go. So if x is the time in seconds since the camera started to move. And y is the camera's distance to the right of the left-hand basket in meters. How do I do defining variables, first of all? What are our three criteria for defining variables? It's got to be a quantity. It's got to be specific. And have units. Okay, all semester. You're going to practice this. 
Students who focus on the quantities in problems and situations, they know what those, how those are defined, and focus on those quantities and how they're changing, those are students who succeed in the course, okay? So we're gonna keep practicing defining variables. So I'm giving you, this kind of gives us a hint as to what situation I'm talking about here. So what situation am I talking about, anyone? Does anything get an idea? Um, Camera, the camera's moving, okay. and it's slowly getting further away from the left-hand basket. And what's that about, left-hand basket? Um, Maybe. I don't know. Presumably the camera's like zooming out or something. Okay. But what left-hand basket? What is it? Are we weaving? Or are we, what are we doing here? Oh. Oh. That's basketball, isn't it? Yeah. What do you think? Are you going to say something? Making a movie. Making a movie. About baskets? Okay, so I was talking about basketball. That's the best court I've drawn all day. <laughs> and so you've been to a sporting event or a concert and they've got these cameras on wires or, or, or long like um, extension rods, right? And they, can, they can move the camera over the crowd or they can zoom in on something that's, that's the focal point of the show or whatever. All right, so we're on the side of the basketball court and the camera is uh, is moving, and our reference point for the camera is the left-hand basket. Here's our reference point. And it's according to this, this situation, y equals 2.4x minus 1.8. So what is the 2.4 in this situation? What does it mean? Somebody knew. Yeah, Jenna. She's saying it's the speed at which the camera is moving. Agree? And how is it moving? Is it changing speed? Constant speed. And what's the units of the speed then? Meters per second. Meters per second. Does that make sense? Are we good? Okay, now notice what, it, what was this negative 1.8? What was that about? I'll never do it good twice. Actually, not too bad. That's not too bad. Okay. What was the negative 1.8? Starting position. Starting position. It's negative. Right? Starting position is negative. Does it work? Does, can we make sense of that? Talk to the person next to you. Yes or no? Can we make sense of a starting y value of negative 1.8? Go. Does it make sense? Let's see here. Freddy. Where's Freddy? What do you think? Negative um, 1.8. Does it can it make sense according to how I've uh, defined these variables? No? no? Yeah. Can't. Kate. Is it 1.8 meters behind the left hand Behind. So what do you mean behind? Like, well, like to the left. To the left. Or Could it be to the left of the left hand basket? Yes. What would zero be? So right here, what would that be? What's that? Uh, for the zero point, it would be a wherever the right of the left hand basket is. So it's not, may not be a specific position on the actual basket, but like just uh, wherever you have your right of it being. But how far right are, of it are we at y equals zero? Uh, in meters, it would be zero meters. Zero meters. So where would the camera be? Right on the basket. Yeah, it would be right on the basket, right? So it would be right on the basket, zero, and then. And then we see that it's moving, what, to the right, because that's increasing. So then what about before? She's saying, Kate's saying that it could be to the left. It could start at negative 1.8. Yeah, right. So we could start over here at time zero. So if our reference point is to the right, then to the left just could be negative distance, or the opposite of distance. So it's perfectly fine. At time equals zero, the camera is negative 1.8 meters 
or 1.8 meters left. It works. Okay, so how do you calculate speed? What's the formula for speed? Speed equals? Okay, I heard a couple people say distance over time. Agree with that? Mm -hmm. Distance over time. So let's look here. This coordinate, coordinate pair here, is this a time and a corresponding distance? Agreed? Time and a distance? Okay, and this is a time and a distance? So I want you to find, for each of those, I want you to find distance over time. Okay, go ahead and find distance over time for this coordinate pair and distance over time for this coordinate pair. Confirm with the person next to you. And then comments. Confirm your results. <coughs> Where's Cecilia? How'd you do? Did you get the first one? Point five six. I think you did maybe time over distance. One point seven seven. Someone else get that? Did you get the next one yet, Cecilia? So what's happening to the speed of the camera? It's increasing. It's increasing, right? Speed is increasing. Remember that? Speed is increasing. Everyone agree? Yes. Anyone not agree? Don't be afraid. You'd be right. Yeah, tell me. Oh, you just want to be right. Tell me why you're right. Change your distance over change of time. Okay, so, so, but, because then you're finding, like, over a certain period of time, how much does it change? Okay. Is the speed of the camera changing? No, it's not. It's not. So what is wrong? We got this. We got. What is the speed of the camera? Two point four. Two point four. 2.4 meters per second. We already talked about that before, right? So why is this number getting greater and it's, it's different than 2.4? What's going on? Michael? You need to be using the delta for it. If you understand correctly, use the same formula to get the same speed. Yeah, so our, our, this is not the formula for speed. It's change in distance over change in time. Change in distance. Distance traveled in elapsed time. So how can we represent change? Delta, delta distance. So let's go back to this point. 2.9, what's the change in time to, in this, given, <coughs> focusing on this point here, what's the change in time? From what to what? From 0 to 2.9. So the change in time is? It's 2.9. That is the change in time. But is 5.16 the change in distance? In that, a lot of, in that amount of time, 2.9, did the camera cover a distance of 5.16 meters? No, find out what distance it covered. Go. Yeah, go. Everyone find it out. What distance did it cover? I'll give you the glory in a second. Yeah, I'll give you the glory. So, yes, delta T is 2.9. But delta D is not 5.16. So Becca says it's something different. Becca, what is it? 6.16. And how'd you get that? You add 1.8 to the 5.16. Right. So the change in distance is, we could say, final distance minus initial distance. Or you could think of adding. Adding the 1.8 to the left to the 5.16 to the right. But just... 
if we're just blindly following the formula, it works too. You can think of it that way, or you can think of it like she said. There's 5.16, it covers 5.16 to the right, and it, before it was it's, it covered 1.8 to the left. So now you get, what did you say it was? 6.96. 6 if we divide that by 2.9, we get it. Any change in distance divided by the corresponding change in time, given any two points, will give us this 2.4 meters per second. That camera is traveling at a constant speed. It's not speeding up. But in order to see that, you have to do a change in distance over the change in time. Okay, questions about that? This was like the flag, remember? The, we did the flag yes, um, Tuesday, and we took uh, height divided by time. We saw that number changed. Did that mean that the flag was going at a non-constant rate? No, you have to look at the change in height over the change in time. That's what determines whether you're a constant rate or not. Not, not just the quantity itself, because you could have a non-zero. If, if, if you go through zero, 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 then distance over time works. But it doesn't if you don't go through zero, zero. Question? Uh, I was just uh, wondering if there's basically any scenario where, where you could have it speeding up and still have a constant rate of change of as soon as possible. So yeah, that's basically a contradiction of terms. Speeding up means it's a non-constant rate. I mean, that's the, those are just two exclusive things. Yeah. Okay, so if we use the second point, the 5.9 to the 2.4, would we find the delta T and delta D from the zero or from the two? Doesn't matter. Any, any change in distance and a corresponding change in time, right? So it's constant ratio, meaning you can set up a million ratios of delta Ds and delta Ts that correspond, we'll always get 2.4. That's the idea of constant ratio reasoning, that that delta D over delta T is the same no matter what two you pick. But they got to be corresponding. It's got to be how, a change in distance for the given change in time. But yeah, so we could, she's saying we could... Well, and that's how you got it in the first place, right? In the first place, to get the 2.4, that's what you did, was that change in time and that change in distance. But now if we come down here, I'll do it in blue here, and we take that change in time and that change in distance, the ratio will be 2.4. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Speaking of speed. Think this has to do with speed? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so this is the world's fastest man, alive and in history, okay? You're, you're a privileged day and age that you, that you get to see the fastest man ever by a mile, okay? So how far did he run? 100 meters. In? 9.58. Okay, so 20 years ago, breaking 10 seconds was a big deal. This is much faster. This is much faster. Okay? 100 meters and 9.58 seconds. Okay? Fast. So, how fast did he run? Go. How fast did he run? Yeah. Just leave it in. <laughs> okay, Andrew Halem, Andrew H. Tell me, what'd you do? Uh, what you did? Process. Distance, 
Okay. Okay, so, so is the distance divided by time? So is it also change in distance over change in time? Is it? Yeah. Yeah, so to be safe, just always do change in distance over change in time, and you'll never be wrong, okay? But in this case, yes, distance from the start over time from the start is the same thing in this particular case because they both start at zero. That's right. Okay, but just to be safe, always change in distance over change in time. And Andrew, what'd you get? 10.438. We'll go with 44. Four. Units? This is how fast he ran. Is that right? So that average is how fast he ran. Okay, so what, yeah, the number 10.44, what, so what does that number, 10.44, 10.44, what? What does that mean, 10.44? Yeah. It means he ran. Every second, on average, he ran 10.44 meters. Okay, how about every second, did he run 10.44 meters? No. Every no, second, did he run 10.44 meters every second? No. 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 What's that? At one point, he has to. At one point, he has to. Was there ever, was there a second where he ran 10.44 meters? Yes. Guaranteed? Yeah. Faster, faster, faster toward the end. Okay, so this is it was something to think about here because we, we calculated the speed by this formula. We know delta v over delta v. And we got this number, 10.44 meters per second, which means going 10.44 meters every second. But now you're telling me he didn't do that. You're telling me he didn't do that. So we've got something to, to wrestle with here, resolve. Jenna wants to... This is on average. Okay. Okay. So, in the first second, did he run more? I've actually re reproduced reproduced his race here. <laughs> so I, I I took the data and I created a formula and then I I recreated his race so that this is where he was on the track at any given point. So up very close to okay. So, uh, two, one, go. So in the first second, did he go more or less than 10.44 meters? Less. In the last second, did he go more or less? <coughs> more. So, it, how often did, did, did he ever go 10.44 meters per second? Maybe a point one. Probably yeah, like maybe one or two different moments, right? But most of the time, by far, he was not going 10.44 meters per second. So what is this number? What is this number? Average. Yeah, okay, so, and that's, so last, you're saying average. So what is that? Add up the bunch, add up the speeds, and divide by the number of speeds? No. How many speeds did he run? He, wrote, he went an infinite number of speeds. So we can't add up the number of speeds and divide by an infinite number of speeds. So this average actually is kind of a, it's kind of a, uh, it's a badly chosen name for this, all right? So we want to make sense of it because you know when we think of average, we think of adding up your test scores, dividing by the number of test scores to see how well I'm doing in the class. Okay? This is different. Something's different here. So what is this number? What is this number? Well, to help you, I have a. Someone else who's going to join the race. If I can do this just the right time here. Here we go. Here she comes. <laughs> it's Emma. Go, Emma. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Oh, come on. Come on. Oh, it's a tie. All right, maybe this time she'll do it. Here we go. Ready? Here we go, three, two, one, go. Come on, come on, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. You can do it, come on, come on. Uh, I still love you. <laughs> <laughs> I keep rooting for her. But they, she always ties, she always ties. 
<laughs> okay, so I got some questions for you. Answer each question. And the, the point is, what does this number 10.44, saying the word average does not cut it. Saying the word average does not cut it. What is this number 10.44 if it's the calculation of Usain's speed? If it's the calculations of Usain's speed, what does this number 10.44 mean? And I'm trying to help you out by giving you Emma here to, to kind of make sense of that. So answer these questions, talk to the person next to you, and see if you can come up with a meaning for this 10.44. Sorry. We're focusing on this right here. What distance does Usain travel? 100. What distance does Emma travel? 100. Okay, so they both travel 100 meters, right? How many seconds does it take for Usain to travel this distance? Emma. Oh, okay. And what was that? Usain's average speed during the race? 10.44 meters per second. Okay. So, what's the purpose of showing Emma? Dan is dying to say. Well, Emma, like, at least, I'm thinking that Emma's speed constantly is okay. 10.44 meters per second. Okay. Um, and I think the purpose of showing her is, like, is, uh, it's, it's comparing Usain's initial speed to his, like, final speed, which are definitely not the same, because initially she's ahead of him, but he catches okay. up to her near the end. Okay. And so, so he said that, that 10.44 is Emma's constant speed. She's going at a constant speed of 10.44 meters per second. Agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. You want to chime in? Oh, well, what did you want to say? Just. Uh, I was just going to say that the average speed is like you'll achieve the same amount of distance in the same amount of seconds. Say it louder. You nailed it. You'll have the same amount of distance in the same amount of time. Right. Okay. So that's what it is. So when you calculate an average speed, he ran a zillion different speeds in that race. But when we calculated the speed, we got one speed. And that can only be a constant speed. But he didn't run a constant speed. So what constant speed is it? The constant speed? That? OK, but what constant speed is it? It's a very specific constant speed relative to you saying. So it's exactly what you said before. It's the constant speed that would? Uh, Anybody <laughs> else want to try it? So it's the constant speed that would do what? Okay, same amount of time. Travel the same distance. It's the constant speed to get the same distance in the same amount of time. In the same amount of time. It's the constant speed to cover the same distance and the same amount of time. That's what that number means. Because it's just one number. It's just one number. It's got to be a constant speed. So it's not his speed. It's not his speed. It's the speed of another runner who covered the same distance at the same time running at a constant speed. Um, is first thing that just the number is to use like a tilde or something around 10.44 or is that Constantly, but still be kind of an approximation or? 
Um, no, it's a, it's a, it's, we, it is the average speed. So we'll use this word average, but we say we acknowledge that's an unfortunate choice for the word, for the, for the term. Okay? But it's the exact value of the average speed because average speed is a constant speed. Average speed is a constant speed, and we know that his speed changed. So it's not, it's not the speed that he ran at. He ran at many speeds. But his average speed is an exact value. The constant, and it's a constant speed for you to cover the same distance in the same amount of time. Okay. Anybody have a question? What's next? Okay, so here's the situation. I've got x is the time in seconds since starting a stopwatch. Let's make that a little bigger. Y is the distance in feet of a scooter from the sidewalk. So some college student is racing to class. Crosses the sidewalk, we hit the stopwatch, and we're going to coordinate, look at, as time increases, and uh, his distance from that sidewalk as time increases. So just as a review of what we're doing here, we're thinking about time increasing. Time increasing, we're going to put time as our x variable, so we're going to look at time increasing on the x-axis. So we imagine this is monitoring what the stopwatch is at, okay? So that blue arrow is monitoring how much time has gone by that we're measuring by the stopwatch. And as that happens, we're going to look at the distance from the sidewalk. Oh, I said that he, we we're starting the stopwatch when he crossed. That we're actually starting the stopwatch a little bit after when he crosses. See that? That he's actually some, a little bit of distance away when I start the stopwatch. Okay, and then as time increases, we're going to look at this other quantity of its distance from the sidewalk. And when I do that, I can, I can pause time. I can say, here at 3.4 seconds, he is, whatever, 22, is that right? Yeah, 22 feet from the, from the sidewalk. And that point represents that, right? That point right there represents that at 3.4 seconds. He is about 23 feet from the sidewalk. We can look at, and then we let time go by, and we get another point. At 5.2 seconds, he's almost 50 feet from the sidewalk. Moving pretty fast. Okay? And so then, if we kept track of all of those points, every single point that represents a point in time, Corresponding distance to the sidewalk, we imagine time increasing. Maybe, please. There we go. If we trace out all the points and leave a trail behind, we get the graph of this relationship of time going by and the student's distance from the sidewalk on their scooter. So let's just, so when you see the graph like this, when you just, so most of your math career, you were just given a graph like this. It was just a curve thrown on a white sheet. What should, how, what's your image be of it? Your real image of it should be this. Your image of it should be this, that it's many points that emerge as time goes by, and we track the corresponding distance, and we let all those points get swept out, and that gives us the graph. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's a quadratic. Yeah. yeah, so this brings up the point. So is is the scooter moving at a constant speed? No. Can you tell? Yeah, what kind of graph is associated with constant rate of change? What kind of graph? Linear, right? Straight line. So we've got a curved graph. So is the speed increasing or decreasing? Increasing. Increasing, okay. So we can think about the inclination 
We said the slope of our constant line is the rate of change. So we could think about coming here and zooming in. If we zoom in enough, what does it look like? That's pretty cool. If I zoom in enough, it's like for a very short amount of time, we got what? Constant rate of change. And so how does this constant rate of change at, at this mo moment of time is like what, 1.1 second? Now let's go later down the road and we'll zoom in on that. Here we are at about seven seconds, seven point seven point one seconds. For a short enough amount of time, it's kind of like for that little amount of time, the scooter is going at a constant rate. How does that constant rate compare to the one at one point one seconds? Yeah, so there's that constant rate of change is much greater because it's a steeper inclination. You get more of a change in y for the same change in x, right? More of a change in distance for the same change in time, which means a higher constant rate of change. So our, our, this is not constant rate of change, it's a changing rate. It's a changing rate of change. So let's focus on the time frame from 3 seconds to 7 seconds. So we're going to look at starting at 3 seconds and ending at 7 seconds, which I almost got there. Close enough. I want to look at that period of time. So where should I look to see uh, the change in time, or the starting value of time and the ending value of time in this graph? Where would I look on the screen to see the starting value of time and the ending value of time? X-axis. You want the x-axis. Agree? Will I look at this point right here? Well, this point does represent what's going on at three seconds, but it doesn't show the value three seconds. We need that reference, which is our axis, right? So to see that actual value, we look down here. And so what about the distance from the, from the sidewalk at three seconds? Where do we look to see the distance from the sidewalk at three seconds? Y axis, right? So the common mistake students say is, oh, it's the point, right? That point tells me what the distance from the sidewalk is. Well, kind of, but the actual value we have to get from the y-axis, or that's where we could we could maybe estimate it. Okay, or I can give you the formula for this, which is 1.5x squared plus x plus 3. So here, here's in a uh, numerical or a symbolic sense, this gives us this relationship between these two quantities, x and y. All right, so what's my change in time? So I'm just, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna let you do this. this. This is the task. This is the task. Find the average rate of change. of the scooter's distance from 3 to 7 seconds since starting the stopwatch. Okay, Find the average rate of change of the scooter's distance from 3 to 7 seconds since starting the stopwatch. This is your task. Go for it. This is, yeah, this is really average speed.
Okay, so we better get our strategy right. How are we going to calculate the average speed in general? Just tell, tell me your name in the hat. I forget your name. Zach, which Zach? Zach T? Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, tell me. So what average speed in general is going to be what? I got about No, no, in general, just we're going to talk through the process here. So how are we going to calculate a number for the average speed? Delta T, delta D over delta T. Change in distance or change in time. Okay. So let's start with the easy part first. What's the easy part? Change in time. What's the change in time? And how could we see that as a calculation for? Yeah, so it's easy because it's obviously four, but if those numbers weren't pretty, to get that change in time, we take final time minus initial time. And that equals four, right? So what about taking the 4, plug, so that we got the change in time of 4. If we plug 4 into that equation, it will give us the corresponding change in distance. What do you think? We've got a change in time. So x is time, y is distance. So plug the 4 in, get the change in distance. What do you think? Does it work? Right? 
Just kind of blank stares. No, not. Oh, you're shaking your head. Okay. And then you find the change. Okay. What would it mean to put four into this? So here, here, I'm the equation. You're gonna give me four. What am I thinking four is? The x value. An x value, right? Which means what? Time since. Yeah. If you put four into the equation, like that's your four seconds. So the answer you're gonna get is what? So your y of four. Right. But so it's not asking. You're not asking. So you have to put three in and then seven in. Okay. That's how you get the two above and then you subtract. Right. So we're this is a big deal because students do this all the time. And maybe your inclination was to do this. If you put four into this equation, this equation doesn't know if it's a, a, if, what you're thinking that number is. But if you put four in there, it's thinking it's an x value. And an x value is time since we started the stopwatch, four. That's what you just put in. And so it's going to crank out what? The corresponding distance at 4 seconds. Is that the same as the change in distance starting at 3 seconds, ending at 7 seconds? How can we illustrate that? We can go, should I go up, down, left, or right from here to show the change in time? Right. Okay. And we said that that is four seconds. That change in time of four seconds is totally different than x equals four, meaning four seconds since we started the stopwatch. So how do I represent the actual change in distance we're talking about on this graph here? How do I represent that? I'll go from here, up, down, left, or right. Up, uh, this far up? No, all the way up here. This y value at x equals 4 is a totally different animal than this change in distance for that change of 4 seconds. So like what she was saying, we need to get, what do we need to get? We need to get the y value at 7 seconds and the y value at 3 seconds first. And how do we calculate the change of a quantity? How do we calculate the change in a quantity? Final minus initial. Final minus initial. So we're going to take y7 minus y4. Y3. What's that? Someone? So this is not, this is a totally different idea, concept than plugging 4 into that. You've got to get the final value distance, initial depth value distance. Subtract. So who? So when you do all that, so you, you put seven in here and you get a number. You put three in here and you get this number. Sorry. You put three in here, you get this number. You put seven here, you get this number. You subtract, and what do you get? Sixty-four. For the difference, average speed. Sixteen. What? So every second, the scooter went sixteen feet. Every second, the scooter went 16 feet. Yes? Every scooter, this, every, every scooter. Every second, the scooter went 16 feet. Yes or no? No. No. What then is the 16 mean? Can you make sense of the 16? I don't know, man. You would need to travel 16 feet. Okay, so you would need to travel on a scooter 16 feet every second to cover this amount of distance and this amount of time. Right, average speed, it's the, it's the constant speed. So this is a one number, it has to be a constant speed. So it's like an equivalent constant speed to how far and he went and the time he went. How would that, how can we represent that average speed on the graph? Well, that, if we graphed this average speed along with the actual distance time curve, yeah. Maybe. So that line that I just added now, that's a shows a constant speed of 16 feet per second. 
what distance, so this is like a different scooter, right? What distance did that different scooter go? How far did that, that second scooter go? 64 feet. And how long? But how did that second scooter do it? At the constant speed of 16 feet per second, right? Representing the average speed of our scooter that we're focused on. Okay. So, this is an important principle that we hammered. Any questions on that? We're going to do one more thing. Any, any questions? Box. That's what it's called, box. Sorry. Okay, so I got for the next class or two, we're going to work on this. I got the sheet of paper. I can vary its width. I can vary its length. All right, so um, I already got a fan over here. Um, so if I was making a, uh, like an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper, I could set the width at 8.5. I could set the length at 11. And then we're going to we're going to cut out squares that can be variable size. All right, so we can cut out real small squares, or we can cut out much larger squares. But we're going to cut out some squares and get rid of them. And then what we have then is when we get rid of those squares, then we we can kind of crease the bottom such that we could fold up the sides and make a box. Okay, so then I so that that's one bo possible box. I can change that I can change that cut like this, make it smaller squares. And I get a different shape box in the end. Okay? What I want you to do right now is to brainstorm on constant and changing quantities in this situation. Constant. The natives are restless. All right, so give me one constant quantity in this situation. I can't do anything here. I'm locked. I need to be. Some, something's locked up here. So let's just name them verbally. So, what's a constant quantity in the situation? John? The thickness of the paper. So, in doing all this stuff, does the thickness of the paper stay constant or does it change? Constant. Okay, so another constant quantity in the situation. 
What's your name again? Yeah. Valerie. Valerie? Okay, we're cutting it though, so we are definitely cutting it. But what about the paper stays the same, even though we cut it and fold up the sides and make a box? Okay. Would, like, the length and width of the paper come from the... Yeah, like the original length and width of the paper. So even though we cut squares out and we fold it up, it's still the original length, original width of the paper is always constant. Okay, what's changing? What's, what's a changing quantity in this situation? Yeah. Area. The area of what? Paper. Okay, so that so after we cut out the squares, how much area? So it'd be like the surface area of the box. That's going to be different depending on what size squares we cut out. Yeah. That. Um, like you said, the size of the squares. Out. Okay, so yeah, the, the side length of the square is varies, right? We cut out small squares or larger squares. What's one more thing that changes. Volume of the resulting box. We can get a low shallow box if we cut small squares. We cut bigger squares, we get a taller, skinnier box, and the volume's going to change depending on how big we cut the squares. One more change in quantity. Yeah. The height of the resulting box is going to change based on how we cut the squares. Okay, so for Tuesday, you've got, uh, you're going to have web work and written. Web work and written. Don't wait till Monday night.